Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another video for Eve Echoes. Today we're going to be continuing our mini-series of preparing for Tech Level 10, because by now it should be literally in the next few days for some people, if it's not already there, depending on when I actually put this video out, because I do record ahead of time. Now, we've already had a look at the battleships, we've had a look at battle cruisers and cruisers, we've even had a look at destroyers, so today I thought we'd have a look at something non-combative, because I know not everyone is a combat pilot and would take a look at the different industrial vessels that are going to be coming at tech level 10. Now, of course, this should go without saying, I am not an industrial pilot. Anyone who knows me knows that my experience of industry is either sitting in a mining belt with a completely unskilled retriever or something, just chilling with uh, the guys and talking, or asking other people to build it for me. So, yeah, I'm, I am not the best source of information for this. As such, I have been spending a lot of time recently talking with various different folks in Void Catskull, um, especially the guys over at RNSI, Rocks and Stocks Industries, um, about what is exciting them, just to get a feel for what's going to be coming here. So, if I do get something wrong, please politely tell me in the comment section down below. Again, I'm not an industrialist, I'm going on other people's information here, but I can use my platform to share that with the rest of you. So, without further ado then, let's jump right into talking about the Tech 10 industrial ships. When it comes to looking at industrial ships on the ship tree, there are a couple of issues. Now, of course, we have our industrial factions, Outer Ring Expeditions and Interbus for mining and hauling, respectively. But if you want to see the main Empire's four ships, well, you're not going to find them in the ship tree, which is why we'll be looking at those on the market later on. But for now, let's start by having a look at the ore ships, Outer Ring Expeditions, because these are your mining ships that you're going to be getting at Tech Level 10. Now, the first one of these to have a look at is the Venture 4. Now, take a brief look at the artwork here at the top left of that panel, just to get an idea for what this ship is going to look like at Tech Level 10. I quite like that handsome terracotta and grey colour scheme to it. I say take a look at it now, because as soon as we hit Learn More, for some reason, the skin does not load on the Venture 4, or indeed the Cover to 2, but we'll talk about that one later. Now, if we have a look at the Venture 4, this, of course, is just a direct upgrade over the Venture 3. And I'm actually kind of looking forward to getting one of these, because that monstrous power grid means that you can actually fit things like medium rapids on there. And if you've ever thought of going out into space in a battle venture, let me tell you, it is great fun. Because other miners just go, oh, hello, fellow miner, how are you doing today? And you go, lol, I'm a pirate, and you open fire with rapids and destroy them in one or two volleys. Anyway, we have fairly decent defences. It is a mining frigate for the most part, but it's got a very small signature radius, which is a very interesting and useful part of this ship. It's also actually surprisingly quick. Good flight velocity, small signature radius, small mass, small inertia means this is a fairly nimble ship. And if we were just to come out and have a look at the standard bit here as well, we can also see it's got a source radius of 188 metres. So whilst that's not exactly a small source radius compared to some other frigate-sized vessels, well, you can reduce that with scanning rigs to get it down to actually quite a smaller point, um, which is going to make you very difficult to scan. That said, however, I would probably not put sort of scanning defense rigs so much onto a Venture 4 as I would put things like, for example, the scanning increase rigs. Because a lot of people ask, what is the point in a Venture 4 in a world that has things like the Retriever, the Procurer, and by, by of course, Tech 10, the Coveter? series of industrials. And it's basically that the Coveters are big, slow, heavy vessels. They are good at strip mining, of course, that is what they are as strip mining barges. But if you just want to jump into a condensed nihilist space and grab all of the, uh, the um, a coxite or whatever you know you want to get, that just one particular ore, the Venture 4 is going to be a much better version for you. You can put a micro warp drive onto this thing, jump into, uh, scan down a, uh, scan down a, uh, what's it called, like a nihilus compressed belt, jump in there, and start mining to your heart's content. And with plus two warp stability and its roll bonus as well, it's actually fairly difficult to pin down. So, I don't know. I would scan, I would use this as sort of a scan for mining sites, jump in and grab what you can, and then make your way to safety afterwards. I'm actually kind of happy to see Ventures coming back. I do really like the Venture ship. It's just a cool looking hull um, that does kind of get glossed over as soon as you hit a high enough tech level to start using the mining barges. So let's have a look at those next because there are two of these at tech level 10. 
First of all, we have the Coveter. Now this one, you can see the skin here does actually load in that traditional or yellow and blue skin color. We get the cool Digimaster Blazon, the Pay Dirt Prospector, which I really like, and the Thermomagnetic Storm. And you'll see I've actually modified the Thermomagnetic Storm for the Coveter 2. That was the intro to this video, but we'll talk about that one later. Looking at its attributes and fittings, the Coveter is, well, it's, it's a mining barge. You've got three um, high slots here that you can now put your strip mining lasers onto, two mid slots, four low slots. You guys are going to know how to fit this a lot better than I do. Um, but looking at its stats, the kind of key points here are that it is still going to be fairly slow and heavy. It is a mining barge, but it is kind of better than Procura in certain ways. You can see we've got the uh, plus warp stability here, 10% strip miner yield, 5% strip miner optimal range, drone EHP and drone velocity. So let's actually jump out for a moment, um, tap on the Coveter at its comparisons and put that next to the Procura just to get an idea because there are some notable differences here. Now first and foremost, that additional strip miner of course is going to come in handy. You're already increasing your basic, uh, your mining cap capability by 33%. That's before applying bonuses, etc. in skills. Just because you've gone from two high slots to three high slots. As we go further down though, you'll see the strip miner yield has dropped, whereas the Procura is 15% strip miner yield. It's only 10% on the Coveter. Again, that's because we've got that additional high slot. The Coveter does still work out with a better strip miner yield overall. Then you get a good optimal range on there as well. 5% optimal range, 25% additional optimal range. Just means you don't have to be as close to the asteroids if you want to be actually strip mining them. Which I'm told is a good thing, because naturally this is a very slow, heavy ship. You don't want to have to be trying to hug everything that you go past. You can just drift languidly through the belt and mine everything. We get better drone EHP, but we don't get quite the same shield bonuses that we would. Um, otherwise, we lose the 5% shield and get a 5% drone velocity, which, arguably, for now, doesn't really do all that much. It helps you out if you've got a whole fleet of coveters sitting in a belt and some unwitting idiot in an interceptor warps in. One of you locks him down, scrams him, the rest of you then just send your drones in and laugh while you rip him apart, death by a 10,000 cuts. But... Ultimately, the loss of the 5% shield there does mean that the Coveter is slightly more fragile. Yes, I know the overall defense appears to have increased, but remember that's not taking into account a 25% increase to shield as of advanced industrial ship operation. So, whilst the rest of the stats there are straight up improvements, we've got a faster warp speed, better flight velocity, although very minor on a ship like this, um, much better power grid, decent capacitors, uh, actually gone down slightly on the capacitor, I hadn't spotted that, it's gone down from 2589 to 2543. Um, standard cargo hold, bigger ore hold though, which is obviously nice, it means you can sit in a belt longer, although you probably won't be in there all that much longer. In fairness, if some of them, uh, the guys I've been talking to have been mathing this out correctly, the Coveter will spend less time in the belt, even though it's got a bigger ore hold, simply because it mines that much, much faster, thanks to its bonuses in that third additional slot. A slightly smaller source radius um, isn't really going to do much. It's still going to be scanned down fairly quickly and easily. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much a direct upgrade over the Procurer. Just it's a slight downgrade in regards to tank. That's about it. But then we hit the Coveter 2, and yes, I know there's a lot of complaints and a lot of confusion. Why is there a Coveter and a Coveter 2 at tech level 10? Because let's look at these side by side. They have the exact same fitting profile. We've got the plus one warp stability on both of them. Um, the optimal range is larger on the Coveter 2. It's a 10% increase, 50% in, at full training compared to the 25% on the Coveter. The strip miner yield has gone from 10%, 50% at full training, to 15%, which is 75% at full training. But then the drones are the same. You then just have a flat-out upgrade on defense, flight velocity, warp speed still the same, but across the board otherwise, the Coveter 2 is a direct upgrade to the Coveter. And so the question is, why would you need both of these at tech level 10? And I think the answer simply is that they didn't really think about where these were going to go. Um, Honestly, I think that there is the argument to be made that obviously the Coveter 2 is considerably more expensive, so you may want to go into a Coveter for the time being just to start your strip mining adventures and then use that to build up to a Coveter 2, and it also means that then if you're out in space in a Coveter 2 and it gets blapped, you still have a Coveter to fall back on, but yeah, once you've got a Coveter 2, there's not really much point ever having a Coveter, and I imagine a lot of people will get the Coveter 2 and then just sell the Coveter, because, well... Yeah, what's the point at that point? Other than just having spares in the dock in case something goes horrifically wrong. But 
I don't know, you know, maybe that's me being unfair to the Coveter and the Coveter 2, but I do think that as we look at the tech tree here, Perhaps it should have been a case that the standard retriever drops down to tech level 6, and then we pr put the procurer... Oh no, hang on, so the retriever's tech level 7, isn't it? We don't have anything at tech level 8. So why didn't we put the procurer at tech level 8, and then the coveter at 9, and then the coveter 2 at 10? That just seems like it would make so much more sense. But hey, I'm not Netties. I'm not the one making these decisions. Um... I just, you know, I, I, I'm just the guy who makes the content and the videos. Um, again, though, if we go in to have a look at the cover tier 2, if you're interested in seeing what that skin looks like, um, unfortunately, it doesn't load at this point in time. We just get a nice, shiny, um, white cover to 2 there, which does actually kind of look kind of cool. I don't know, maybe we could get that as a skin. But then we have the Thermomagnetic Storm Core, which does look pretty awesome, even if it does absolutely nothing. And I've modified mine here on the test server to have sort of soft, pinky-purple accents, because, yeah, fun fact... Sakura pink is my favourite colour. I love that cherry blossom pink colour. Anyway, so that's the cover to two. Let's then have a look into some of the Interbus ships. Now, if I'm being completely honest, if you thought I was out of my depth talking about the Outer Ring Expedition ships, then I'm even worse when it comes to Interbus, because hauling, as I've admitted many times, is one of these things that I just don't really do in Eve Echoes. Um, it's an interesting way of making money. I know it definitely needs some overhauls at time of pun intended, at time of me making this video, but let's have a look at what's coming, because we have the Humpback High Mobility at Tech Level 9, and then we get the Humpback Hauling at Tech Level 10, alongside the hump Humpback Combat. So if we have a look at these ships side by side, um, you'll see that the Humpback Combat gets four drone tubes, it gets a fourth high slot, it gets a fourth mid slot, a fifth low slot, and addition, well, and the same three rigs as the Humpback Hauling would. Um, so yeah, definitely this is a ship that can actually pack a little bit of firepower behind it, which for a hauling ship, I just, I just don't really see, because I don't see many people taking hauling ships any further than low sec. Most people are going to be going from ITC to ITC to ITC, and if I'm being completely honest, I do use use the send to my nearest ITC function and wait for people to deliver it. I've done that many times to get things delivered to places like Pater or Masper or Berai or wherever I happen to be doing missions and that at that point in time. However, every single time I've asked it to be sent to somewhere like the, the one in the Great Wildlands, G-E-G -E or whatever it's called, um, the one in the Great Wildlands, it's very rare that that delivery ever gets taken through. I don't know if it's just that people take it and then get destroyed, or if people just ignore the fact that it is, you know, it, it, it's there because it's one that's going to take you into null sec, and let's be fair, going through the Conora gate into Enrail as a system is never fun for anyone, let alone if you're in a slow-ass hauler. So I just, I, I don't see the point in a combat hauler, um, other than to be like a honeypot in Nullsec, but it's, you, you've got to be blooming gullible to take a, hun you know, a honeypot in Nullsec, it just, there's no reason to ever do that. So, you know, as we're looking at it otherwise, you've got that additional shield and structure there, so it's a tanky little ship, the, well, tanky big ship, the humpback combat, but... I don't know, I just think that if you're using a humpback, it's because you want to do massive deliveries in high sec, at which point that additional shield and additional structure doesn't matter. The drone HP and drone command range doesn't matter because you're not ever going to actually be using this thing in a combat role because, well, you're going from gate to gate to gate. This means then that looking at those two, the humpback hauling, that the fact that it gets that 5% additional delivery hold and 5% additional cargo hold, just... I don't know, it just, that to me seems the much more logical choice to get here. Now if we actually compare the holds down here, you'll see that the delivery hold on the humpback hauling is just massively larger anyway, as is the cargo hold capacity. So, if you're doing deliveries, surely the bigger hold is better, and then you're going to add on an additional 25% to those? I don't know, I think even if you're going to be moving like a, a humpback through null sec, and you are worried about it getting caught, I think having the bigger cargo hold just is going to be the option to go for, simply because you can have friends with you, you can bring a fleet with you, and if you're taking a hauler like this through null sec, because let's be fair, 76 meters per second flight velocity and a uh, an agility and inertia that is just as absolutely terrible, you're going to need some flight support anyway. Even if you're in a humpback combat, I just don't think that four high slots and four drones without any real bonuses to any of those, it's not like you're getting a massive drone damage bonus or, you know, combat bonus. You're just never going to kill anything. Yeah, you've got huge amounts of tank there, you know, uh, 58,118, but even then, 
The humpback hauling has a bigger defense to start with. Yeah, I'm sure that by the time you add that 25% shield and 25% structure on, it does go over the humpback hauling, but is it really worth it is my point. Again, if you are into hauling, let me know in the combat, uh, in the co combat section below. Yeah, sometimes the comment section can be, feel like the combat section. Um, <laughs> let me know in the comment section if you're a hauler, if the humpback is something you're ever going to use. Because I know a lot of people are just like, you know, there's no point. You never need that much cargo space and it just takes too long to get from A to B. You know, they'd rather do the deliveries in smaller ships, smaller, faster ships. So I don't know, maybe the humpback is just one of those ships that is going to be lost to obscurity, which is a shame because it's a really interesting looking ship. It just looks like a slab of industry, you know, a slab of industry flying through space. But I don't know. Let me know your thoughts on that one if you're a hauler. Now, for some unknown reason, if you want to go looking for the industrial ships of the four main empires, you won't find them on the ship tree. In EVE Online, they have their own unique branch to the right of battleships and things like that. You can go there and start looking at the industrial ships. But for some unknown reason in EVE Echoes, the only way to find these is in the market. So that's why we're here. Now, this unfortunately means you don't get the ability to do the whole add to comparisons and look at them side by side. Fortunately, however, I have my Silent Rose notebook, which I got off our Redbubble merchandise store. There's a subtle little plug for you to go and check it out. So I've been able to manually write these down side by side and give an idea of them in comparison. So we're going to look at these one by one. Now, in EVE Online, these are kind of referred to as the blockade runners, and you'll see why in just a moment. So let's start off with the Badger 2, as it's the first one. Now, here is straight away, you should be able to see if I'm going to actually come in on the trait description here, why this is called a blockade runner. And it's that roll bonus, it's the ability to fit Covert Ops cloaking devices. This really helps you in a gate camp. It means that as soon as you arrive in a system, like a nullsec system, and you're inside an interdiction sphere, for example, you can just immediately, as you start to, you know, align and go to warp, you can immediately add the Covert Ops cloak, and then as you drift out of the bubble, you should be very, well, impossible to lock onto unless they kind of figure out exactly where you were in space and get within two kilometers, which isn't all that difficult, but hey, it helps. It also means if you know there's a gate camp on the other end of the jump that you're doing, you can hit that cloak whilst you're in warp, um, and so you land in the bubble again, completely invisible and cloaked on your way through. That makes the blockade runners somewhat useful, you know, it means that if you do want to be doing deliveries and things into and out of nullsec, um, then you've got that little bit of security of being able to put a covert ops cloak on there so that you can just hide if needs be. I mean, heck, if you see that people are chasing you, warp to a planet or to a safe spot or whatever and activate the cloak on the way and just drift off to the sides. And again, it makes it very difficult for them to actually figure out where you are and to lock onto you. They can see you in local, but they can't scan you down if you're cloaked. Anyway, so the actual ships themselves are pretty much and much the same. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go through all things like the power grid and that here on these, because on a combat vessel, it makes a lot of difference. On something like a, a blockade runner, a hauling ship, that kind of thing, it doesn't make all that much of a difference. So we're just going to talk about these in terms of their trait descriptions and the main stats side by side. So the Badger here has a defense of 8,175, which makes it actually the most vulnerable of the four blockade runners. It's got the lowest overall defense. Yes, it's got the largest shields, so if you are just going to be putting all of your tank into the shields, it's a good block of HP there that your opponent has to get through, but overall, it is the weakest. As we come further down, we've got a flight velocity of 146, which on paper is the slowest of the four. However, we do have that trait description here. Advanced Industrial Ship Command bonus per level plus 5% flight velocity. If we add the 25% flight velocity on there, that 146 goes up to 182.5, which actually makes it the fastest for flight velocity. You may be thinking, what's flight velocity got to do with anything? Ultimately, again, for a blockade runner, it means that when your covert ops cloak is on, you have no ability to use propulsion. Yes, you can quickly hit a micro warp drive as you hit the cloak and you'll get one activation of the micro warp drive. Um, but it just once that's gone, you're just drifting on impulse, basically. So the faster you're going, the higher your flight velocity, the better that micro warp drive boost is going to be. And when, once the micro warp drive is off, you're still going to be able to travel faster, um, especially if you've just landed into a bubble, for example. Um, the warp speed is 4.5 on this one, um, power grid, capacitor, it's all pretty much much the same as I said. We then have a standard cargo hold here 
of, uh, I think on this one, it is uh, 16,500 cubic meters. And you'll see that if I just do the standard tap here. Again, I'm reading this. Um, I'm reading this from my notebook. But if I scroll down here, 16,500 cubic meters. I'm just putting this page up because it looks a little bit nicer for the purposes of the video. But basically, yeah, 16,500 cubic meters of cargo hold um, is amongst the largest of the four. It's beaten by the nearest two, spoiler alert, um, but it is right up there amongst the largest. Um, it, then we have the Badger 2 having its own uh, special hold, which for the Badger 2 is the ship hold, and 31,500 cubic meters, great for transporting ships, again, from high sex station to high sex station, or helping your... Uh, your uh, your alliance move ships to a new home, or heck, moving a fleet into position ready to begin war or things like that. Lots of little uses you can use that ship hold for. Source radius of 253 is also the largest of the lot, um, and if we look at its mass and inertia, which if I just jump back here to give the numbers on screen, uh, it's 10.65 million kilograms with an inertia of 0.49, gives you an agility rating of 5.22, which for an industrial ship is not bad. That's actually fairly agile. Like, look, it's not going to be outrunning a frigate anytime soon, or heck, even a destroyer, but it's not as bad even as a battleship. That's not bad, and it gives you that little bit of extra use when you are running through dangerous space, and you want to be, well, blockade running, hence the name. Now, moving on, then let's have a look at the Wreath 2. This is the Minmatar ship, and I actually quite like the look of this one. I do like the Badger 2 as well in its looks, um, but the Wreath, there's just something really simplistic and quite industrial about this that I quite like. The Angel Veteran Corps especially makes it look amazing, um, although that is a core that is very expensive to make and offers no tangible bonus other than a flight velocity increase, which, in fairness, may be useful because that flight velocity increase could push this above the uh, Badger 2 into the highest flight velocity. And um, it's not far off as standard. So if you were to put the uh, the Angel Veteran skin on a Nano Core on there and go for the flight velocity increase, which I believe is 17.4%, that would push you considerably over the Badger 2. Anyway, so if we're having a look at the trait descriptions, again, we've got that Covert Ops cloaking device. This is a blockade runner. That's the entire point of them. Um, defensively speaking, 8,511 um, is it's middling. It's second highest, but it's only just above third. Um, so it's not quite the tankiest one out there, but it's got a good amount of HP and defense across the board there. Its warp speed starts at 4.5 AUs like the others, but it gets an increase to its warp speed, 25% for Advanced Industrial Ship Command. That takes its warp speed up to 5.6. Great if you're doing long journeys. Again, if you're going from, say, a low sec, uh, sorry, a null sec um, mining outpost and you want to take that up to Jita to sell, for example, that could be anything between 30 and 40 jumps away. Having a faster flight uh, warp speed is going to help you clear that distance faster and not get so ridiculously bored en route. I don't know. That's my thoughts on that one. Um, the inertia modifier of 5% down. Uh, by the way, I haven't mentioned for any of these because it is the same across the board for all of them. If you have advanced engine operation at level 5, all five, uh, all four of these uh, blockade runners are going to have 25% reduced inertia modifier. Now, continuing to look down the Wreath 2's stats, um, not only is it, as I said, it's got a decent warp speed there of 4.5, which becomes 5.6 at full training, it's got a flight velocity of 176, which is the fastest of the blockade runners on paper. Again, the Badger 2 get, caps out at 182.5 with its training, but if you were to put a nano core on this one with the fl uh, flight velocity, yeah, the Wreath 2 is going to massively overshoot that, but again, I'm not really sure that's worth the cost, um, so don't take me too seriously on that one. I'm just theory crafting and mathing things out. The agility rating on this one, 10 million um, kilograms in mass, 0.47 times inertia, gives us an agility rating of 4.7. It is the Minmatar ship, of course, it is the most agile. That usually goes without saying. For some reason, it's different on the Fenrir and the freighters, um, but here on the blockade runners, yes, that still remains the same. The Minmatar one is technically the most agile there. Um, it's going to achieve warp faster, and it has the fastest warp speed. Excellent for running longer distances, as I said. Now, its cargo hold is 14,400 cubic meters. Um, it's not the smallest of the, uh, of, the, of the blockade runners. It's not the largest either. You've got the Badger 2 there at 16,500, uh, 16, and the nearest at 16,875. They are considerably larger, um, but spoiler alert, the Sigil 2 sits down at 10,500. So it's between the two, but toward the, uh, between the 
it's in the middle, but it's toward the higher end. Um, I hope that makes sense. And it's got an ore hold. The special hold this time around is a 31,500 cubic meters hold dedicated to ore and compressed ore. And that means you can carry an absolute ton of this stuff um, going around. Um, obviously, you don't necessarily have to use the wreath too just for carrying ore. That's just the ore hold. Obviously, it's dedicated to it. But if you want to carry other things, you've still got that cargo of 14,400. And at this point, I'm just going to point out as well that if you have cargo amplifying rigs, those only affect the cargo hold, not the special hold. Although if you're watching this video and you're hitting tech level 10 as an industrial, I'm pretty sure you figured that out already. Right, let's move on from the Wreath 2 to the Sigil 2, the Amarian variant. Um, this weird looking sort of leech-esque ship. Yeah, I'm referring to the Amar as a leech. I, I think it's fair. Um, what with them being, you know, God-fearing slave laser monkeys. Anyway, the Sigil. <laughs> <laughs> the Sigil, we've got a defence here, the highest of the lot, 8,778, highest basic defence of any of these blockade runners. Our flight velocity sits at 160, which isn't the slowest, that still goes to the nearest two, um, but it's on the slower end of things. We've got a standard warp speed of 4.5, power grid, capacitor, down to the cargo hold. Cargo hold on the Sigil 2 is the smallest of the lot, at 10,500 cubic metres. This is not a ship that you're going to want to have necessarily for running just standard cargo, things that don't fit in a special hold. The advantage of the Sigil 2 is its special hold, 31,500 cubic meters dedicated to carrying structures and structure modules. So if you want to put up a couple of uh, outposts or corporation citadels and maybe later on gate guns if netties ever do get around to adding those, that kind of thing, um, then a Sigil 2 is a great way to do it because you can pop that covert ops cloak on, jump to a safe point if whilst you're moving and about to put a system up, um, a fleet of enemy ships appears, you can just jump to a safe spot and cloak um, and not have to worry about that too much because losing a Sigil 2 with several outposts in it is a big oof. Like, probably the biggest oof I could imagine in EVE Echoes, to be fair. Now, if we look at its trait description, you'll see here it's got the same inertia modifier reduction, but it has a 5% reduction to signature radius, which, honestly... I just don't see as at all useful. The signature radius here on the Sigil 2 is massive anyway, um, 76 meters. Um, I say massive, it's actually fairly low for an industrial. So, uh, I don't know, I'm doubting myself as I say that now. 76 with a 25% reduction. Yeah, okay, actually, that is a fair reduction. It means that something like a battleship or a battle cruiser is going to have difficulty locking on, but it only comes into effect if you completely fail to use the, uh, the, the, the Covert Ops cloak effectively. So, I don't know. I don't know. I kind of... <sighs> That's the point I've got noted down here. I've got the, the fact that the signature radius and um, reduction isn't overly useful. And I think that's simply because the Covert Ops Cloak, as I said, is your first line of defense. And you, the signature radius only comes into play if you mess up your Covert Ops Cloak usage. I suppose it means that if they've got an Interceptor or like a Venture or something trying to be an instant point inside a gate camp, um, you might uh, it might take a little bit longer for them to lock on so they're not as quickly instant point. I don't know. I don't know, if you're, a, if you're a hauler, let me know your thoughts on that one in the comments below. I'll put my hands up and say, I, I personally don't think that signature radius reduction is huge. I don't think it's overly useful um, compared to, for example, additional warp speed. But I could be missing something. Again, it might actually be that, yeah, that the fact that uh, you, you've got a second or two before you can put the cloak up... Um, might be enough that someone could lock you and thus having a smaller signature radius makes you unlockable. I don't know. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. Otherwise, agility-wise, um, 11 million kilograms, 0.48 um, inertia, gives us 5.28, which is the second slowest, the second least agile of these runners. So perhaps that's why the signature bonus comes in, because it's going to take you a little bit of time to align. Finally, then, let's have a look at the nearest two, which is the Galente Federation's offering, and I tapped the wrong button there. Here it is. It's the typical hauling vessel. You see it in all the interbus artwork, and heck, it's a Nereus. What do you expect? Now, again, we've got a defense here, 8,460. Second highest defense, and um, the Sigil 2 is 8,778. Um, so it's about 300 lower than the Sigil 2, but it's still considerably higher than the Badger or the Wreath. Our flight velocity here um, is 157, which, again, is middling to... It's the lowest 
It's the lowest of the lot, in fairness. If you look on paper, the Badger 2 is the smallest, uh, is the slowest, um, but it gets that bonus that takes it up to 182. So the nearest two is the slowest, uh, crawling behind the Sigil 2 by 3 meters per second. 160 on the Sigil 2, 157 on the nearest two. 4.5 warp speed, because that's not what its bonus is to. Um, power grid, capacitor, we know all of this. Cargo hold, 16,875. That is the biggest cargo hold of these on paper. Straight up, your basic cargo hold on this, 16,875. Second largest is the Badger at 16,500. The Wreath 2 has 14,400. And the Sigil 2 has its pitiful, in, in inverted commas, 10,500. What makes the nearest 2 so crazy when it comes to its cargo hold is it gets an additional 5% cargo hold capacity, which, let's actually math that one out because I haven't even written that down. Pull up my calculator app, which I can do in-game here. We've got 16,000. 875 and we're going to add on 25% to that to see what that comes out to. That gives us a cargo hold of 21,093 cubic meters. That's huge. That is a huge cargo hold. Um, that's actually almost double the Sigil 2's cargo hold. Um, and then has its dedicated mineral hold again, 31,500 cubic meters of mineral hold. Um, I think that if you're just wanting basic hauling, like just carrying something that's not ore or minerals, or heck, minerals would be this one anyway. If you're not carrying structures or minerals, I keep saying minerals, if you're not carrying structure, ore or ships, then the nearest is probably going to be the better option for you. And in fairness, that cargo hold being that big is probably big enough to carry most of the capsuleer outposts or corporation citadels that you want to as well. I don't know, I think the nearest two, that is just a mad amount of cargo, both in terms of its mineral hold and its dedicated cargo hold. Just, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. You can fit a fleet in that. <laughs> well, obviously the, the Badger 2 is better for fitting a fleet in because it's got the de dedicated uh, ship hold, but hey, um, as we look at then, we come down to agility, 11.25 million kilograms and a 0.47 inertia modifier gives us 5.29 agility, good for an industrial ship, worst of the blockade runners by 0 0.09, uh, 0.01, sorry, going from 5.28 on the Sigil 2 to 5.29 on the nearest 2, so it's slightly less agile than the Sigil. So, there's your four ships. Ultimately, there's really not much and much in it. I think looks are going to play, uh, play a certain factor. I think, honestly, the Wreath 2 is my personal favourite, and not just because it's Minmatar, but because it's got that fast flight velocity and the quickest align time out of them all, um, meaning that, you know, it's just it's going to clear those distances that little bit faster. I think otherwise, though, the nearest to that cargo hold on it is just insane. I think those, those are going to be the ones that are going to be most popular out of these. But again, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below. Otherwise, folks, that brings us to the end of my little video here on the Tech 10 Industrials. Again, I remind you that I am not an industrial player. These are my thoughts and opinions based on conversations with other players. If you if you know people in your industry, in your corporation who are heavily involved in industry, they might have better insight than I do. But I thought this would be a nice little video just to give you an exciting starting point um, and get to see one of these on screen, etc. as well. Anyway, folks, let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. What are you most excited for um, and before you say nano cores for industrial ships please be aware as well netties have confirmed that the next battle pass will have brand new um, nano cores in it um, and those should be better for certain ships now considering the main complaints have been things for drones industrials and missiles i expect those will be the three types of better nano core we see and i'm hoping that yes that does include the industrials and that should be just as we're all hitting tech 10 as well so congratulations if you do hold on to your concord credits from the current concord pass they will carry across to the new pass as well so you'll hit Tech 10, you'll be able to build your Coveter or Coveter 2 or whatever, and you should hopefully have enough points to buy yourself a Nano Core for it on day one, which would be amazing, I think. But hey, there we go. Otherwise, folks, thank you for listening to me ramble on about industrial ships. Um, happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.